So the second session is, is a continuation of focusing on this theme that we have of strengthening the ties between observation and user communities. And we're really focusing on a disaster use case and a disaster theme through this panel. Um, and we have an interesting set of panelists um, coming from both data provider and user perspectives. And one of the things that people have said to me over the last several years is, you know, we want more users at ESIP. We would like to know, we would like to have some end users. Um, and that just keeps coming up over and over in the, the plenary or in the, the meeting survey responses. And so I'm really happy to say that on this panel, we have two real users. <laughs> um, Wally Malia I'm not. coming from the Edison Electric Institute and Carrie Hicks coming from Duke Energy who are going to talk about their earth observation needs. But before we get started um, directly into the panel, I also wanted to take this opportunity to share a little bit of work that's been going on in ESIP that we don't, we haven't heard a lot about. So first I wanted to start, this is um, actually backing up. So ESIP has been in this partnership with a group called the All Hazards Consortium, which is a lot like ESIP, but it's bringing together utility companies, the food sector, the fuel sector, telecom, all around their disaster related um, data and energy and um, information needs. And so it's been really interesting for me to get to participate in this group. And I gave a talk at one of their first workshops on data-driven decision-making, and I use this slide about why I care about data um, and information. And I started with this image, which is a hurricane coming up the coast of North Carolina in 1999. It was Hurricane Fran. Um, but this wasn't really the data that I wanted to show. I, first, I wanted to show this picture of my brother in our backyard when Fran hit our backyard. And so I had... And I thought I was telling the story about getting us all on the same page for, um, you know, I've been in a hurricane and you utility people have also been in hurricanes. But really what it turned out to be was a data story because I had this memory of the data, the, the data of the picture on the left of my brother. And that was really hard to find. Um, my mom couldn't find it. She thought it was lost. We'd send it in the mail to my grandparents so we didn't have it. Couldn't find it, couldn't access it, couldn't use it, even though I knew it existed. And the data on the right came from NOAA, and there's a web page for Fran um, with this animation. It was easy to find. I Googled it, I got the right date, um, and I was able to put it into my presentation in a format that I could use. So, um, you know, I think we've really come a long way with earth science data and information. So, this is. Um, ESIP funds things called test beds, and we're going to start calling them incubators. But one of the incubators that we had was a collaboration between Storm Center Communications and the All Hazards Consortium, where we piloted using the technology GeoCollaborate. And this was something that we had no idea if it was going to work, um, and it turned out being a pretty epic success, I think um, we could say. And that's led to now wanting to be able to find from ESIP more data for these decision makers. And so we know that it exists and it's how do we leverage the ESIP community to access resources that you all know about that we could then share with the utility companies or others that are looking for this data in real time and need to trust it. Um, so the, the 3DM, the, the data-driven decision making process is to establish a work group um, they have a trust framework that they're, they're building. Um, they're developing these use cases, and the use cases are really the glue between our community and, and these user communities, and then to validate and operationalize. And so we're going to have, um, and this shows sort of more of that glue, we're going to have another workshop in January, at the end of January. And so if at the end of this panel you're interested in working more on this activity, um, I would really welcome conversations on this and to see if it's a direction that we want to take the ESIP community. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to this panel. And first, I'd like to introduce Frank Lindsay, who is a friend of ESIP and we know really well. Um, Frank is a system engineer at NASA Goddard and is going to talk about the um, American Customer Satisfaction Index <laughs> okay. survey. Um, and Frank, I'm going to move the slides to you. Oh. And you can come up here. Oh. I thought I could sit. <laughs> you can sit again. Um, 
remember Madison? No. I bet I couldn't get any lights going. Oh. And then you blamed it on me. No, I don't. You don't Package. Enter full screen. Well, okay. okay. Hey everybody, it's good, so good to see so many familiar faces. So um, I think the impetus for this talk, and it's good that it's leading it off because, uh, uh, and I'll explain why, that uh, I think there's some folks out there in the community who are interested in how we actually know what users want and how we go about taking that input and developing our systems you know, in reaction to that. The disaster community, of course, being one of those. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then obviously the uh, ladies and gentlemen here on the, the dais will, will get specifically into disasters as well. But hopefully many of you aren't aware of some of the work that, that we actually do in Estes, and this will help do that. All right. So user experiences we have found are not always ideal. And I think this picture you know, <laughs> says a, a million words. There's a lot embedded in that picture. But this talk is going to be focused on that, how we in Estes uh, want to help you know, our users, their needs and their expectations, how we do that. So you can say, you know, we designed this beautiful pathway for you and what user, what are you doing? You're taking a shortcut. You're willing to walk through the mud. You know, we've, we've designed that. So we're trying to close that triangle between what the users actually want, how they want to get their data and the systems and services that we actually design as well. So that's what I'm gonna focus on. All right, so ESDIS uh, and NASA's EOSDIS in, in just four bullets. The lion's share of folks are aware of the Earth Observing System data and information system, the, the very large system, you know, some 20 years old now that supports Earth sciences at, at NASA with literally millions of users. The backbone of that, of course, is our 12 discipline-oriented uh, data centers, as well as an equal number of SIPs that do a lot of the science data processing as well. So we initially, of course, those, those data centers, those DACs, uh, being disciplined, um, you know, focused, wanted to serve those user communities using the particular kind of data instruments, um, data products, et cetera. But we also provide this backbone, this network that's able to ship around terabytes of data, you know, between the various highly distributed centers across the UN, United States and internationally as well. But we also develop tools and services. Early on, it was known you can't just give somebody an HDF file necessarily. We really have to work with user communities to help them to lower that bar so they can actually use the products that they need. And lastly, we don't do this in a vacuum. Uh, it's a highly integrated data system that works uh, nationally and internationally. So uh, uh, it's been quite a success for the last 20 years. All right. So some of those systems, we can learn some, you know, fairly generic things about our users, like where are the data being distributed? So for 2016, you could see that, you know, the lion's share was pretty much distributed internationally, uh, not quite half uh, here in the United States. That tells us something. It tells us about where these users are, the data products and where these things are actually going. That's somewhat useful. However, uh, this is a, a chart that I, I, I borrowed uh, from Chris Linnis, and he, he, our data architect, and he was thinking about it, and he said, well, actually, we have all kinds of inputs from our users, and, uh, and they range. The ACSI, so on the, on the one hand, we have sample size. How many people are we actually engaging and talking to? And at the bottom, what are they telling us? Just a little bit, or are they really going into the, the weeds with us about what their user needs might be? And so we have this whole range. The ACSI, I'm going to talk about in just a second, is one of these where we have a very large amount, and we, we obviously can gather information from that. But if you go down, we also attend application workshops that have hundreds of people that um, are these con conference encounters, uh, AGU, et cetera. We have uh, advisory groups that still provide information, the UWGs that advise the DACs as well. They have input. And even all the way down to help tickets where people are saying, this button does not work. So it's a gamut of information that we're actually taking in. And the webinar and that feedback, I'm going to talk about at the very end. So keep this in mind as we walk through these. All right. What is this mysterious American Consumer Satisfaction <laughs> Index, ACSI? Just many of you, probably quite a few, have interacted with us uh, on this survey. And this is a little background about that and how we use it. So this thing was developed at the University of Michigan, and it's a uniform national cross-industry measure of customer satisfaction. And so they deal with over 300 companies, 100 federal, local governments. 
Um, so it is out there. It has been and it is widely used as well. So it's a measure of customer satisfaction, but there's a predictive link. The secret sauce in this, in essence, is they're going to tell you how well you're doing in particular areas and what actions you may be able to take to increase your score, to increase that user satisfaction as well. We work with a company called CFI that happens to hold the patent to the uh, modeling engine that actually denotes or actually derives that uh, score. And again, as I said, one of the reasons why we like to use it is actionable. There's customer um, feedback that we can actually look at our systems to see where we could tweak them to actually do a bit better. Oh, and by the way, back when we were reinventing government in the 90s, there was this act, PL10362, the GPRA, that um, I think it was uh, Al Gore at the, at the time, that uh, wanted agencies to introduce performance measurements. Just don't say, uh, you know, we're doing great. There should be an independent body out there looking at what government does, what industry does, and, and saying if you're actually uh, meeting it. So for us, that is EOS DIST, ESDIS, the project that manages um, EOS DIST, we want that information system for, for each of the DACs. We want to know how our data centers are doing, and we want to use this so that we can leverage um, things, activities that go on in the DAC so we can continuously, and that's why I underlined it here, continuously improve the service to its customers as well. And so for us, um, the CFI, we broke it down in these six areas that, that I'll talk about on this next chart. So this is a cartoon of how they actually derive it. And again, since it's proprietary, it's basically a weighting scheme for these six areas on the left, that, that what they call satisfaction drivers. So product quality, uh, selection, customer support, documentation, search, and delivery. And these are drivers that all, you know, once scored, um, you know, derive the index for this year was, you know, a 77. And on the far right-hand side, they're giving you measures of, uh, if you change your score, of if you improve it, what is likely to impact. And that would be the likelihood to recommend your service, as well as user services in the future that that person or group would use. And I have many skills. One of them is not survey methodology. So I put the link at the bottom. It's a fascinating PDF. It really goes into a lot of detail of how they derive that score without actually showing you the weighting that they use to apply it itself. So if you're interested in that, um, rather than me, you could look at that. So, so the general benchmarks, where do we fall? So for this year, EOS DIS, right next to that arrow there, is a 77. And we've done this for over 10 years now. And don't think of this as like a grading scheme, like 100, 90, 80. You know, we're just a C student. Not at all. I put others down here so you could see, like the overall federal government for 2015, because they haven't done theirs yet, uh, you know, it's a 64, you know, we're significantly higher. And um, Jeannie Benke, who's uh, one of our, our deputy project manager, um, she emailed me, we've been texting back and forth. And uh, I want to bring this point up because I didn't know about this. We have a very large sample size, much larger than many of the bodies. We have over 7,000 um, uh, respondents, you know, to the survey. That's quite a few. So for instance, if you looked at the rural development, that is uh, based on maybe 50 to 70 uh, 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 respondents as well. So in fact, CFI likes dealing with us because our sample size is so much larger than a lot of the other groups on the federal side um, that they deal with as well. So you have to take, you know, our relative comparison here with with a grain of salt. So, and if you're interested in this, you can go to the CFI website and they, in real time, you know, they're updating these things all the time, you know, across a variety of industries. It's fascinating stuff. But aside from that very general number, and again, we're doing that for the GPRA, we're doing that for OMB so that we have a, a, a uh, independent body that's assessing how well we're doing based upon user feedback. But we've turned this thing around to actually, it can be very useful. These are some of the areas that we also look at in the survey as well. Like what areas of earth science you know, and services are you know, folks coming from? Here for last year, two thirds uh, were you know, uh, services for the land community, 28% for the atmosphere, 15% uh, for the biosphere, et cetera. So when we're looking at our systems, we can tailor them more based upon our knowledge of where our community uh, is, is coming from and where they're interested in. We even did something on software packages. What do you use alongside uh, the data to actually get your research or application done as well? And three quarter, over three quarters of them uh, stated using some software tool packages as well. Very important, again, when you're making investments in your system.
All right, one other thing, and I'm gonna go very quickly through this. One, all right. So we also pulled together because all, remember, think of that range of things, the inputs that we're, we're getting from all those sources. So last year we called together a user need technical interchange meeting where we utilize information coming in uh, all the data centers and we sat down for two days and we wanted to sort, categorize these, uh, you know, do an assessment and prioritization because even if we get thousands of brilliant suggestions about what we might be doing, there's only limited funds to do so many. And again, since we're not build, we're building a system to serve all of our sciences, you know, not just a one particular segment. So this type of information prioritization is absolutely, excuse me, absolutely key. So we did a lot of whiteboarding. And this was the outcome. So this is uh, on our wiki and you can go look at it. The blue ones were the, those uh, suggestions, those user needs that could really be handled technically by some of the groups that we have already uh, working with ESDIS, but there's many others uh, that do not. So this was our, if you've ever been on a panel in the final day and you do a rack and stack of proposals to say, what is our consensus? What do we think is the top priority? What's the best one here? And we followed a very similar format. And I must say that unlike hurting you know, a room full of cats, we really did get consensus across a very diverse group of data centers on what were top priorities as well. So one last slide really on social media, which is a whole nother area. And just to let you know, since I'm running out of time, the communications team for ESDIS has a poster out there that has everything I've talked about here and a lot more. So, um, so you can go into depth. But a couple things that we've really found that work very well are these webinars where we have professionals from the community coming in, talking to other folks interested in data products, tools, et cetera, and these things have been wildly popular. And the reason why I put this in here is because that is another incredibly valuable source of a user sitting down with you, going through some data product, and they can let you know what they do or don't like, what they need or what they might not need as well. So as takeaways very quickly, so you know, we do, we use all of these inputs to evolve you know, the data system. We know we have more communities, we're gonna have more missions, we're gonna have more data products. So it's not gonna stop. So that's exceedingly important. We don't collect a bunch of data and ignore it. Um, so we have a whole variety of methods that I talked to you about as well. And we often collect way more than we can use. And in those instances, we use like mediating, you know, knowledgeable people to help us understand those particular user communities like disasters. And lastly, help us. So I've mentioned some here, but what are we missing? What are ways, means, you know, medium that you know of that we could actually get even more inputs? And I'm gonna hear some from the disaster community here that I'm really interested in doing that. And that's it, thank you all. Thanks so much, Frank. So next up we have Wally Malia, who's from the Edison Electric Institute and um, multitasking is not my So Wally is from the Edison Electric Institute, and this is a fairly new association for me, um, but again, it's bringing together the utility companies, and he'll say a bit more about that. He serves as the manager for the business continuity group, and in this role, he supports their initiatives and programs and policies to improve the industry's response to major outages and maintain business operations. And this includes EEI's national response event framework, the Spare Transformer Equipment Program, and the, industry, the industry's transformer transportation initiative and cyber mutual assistance. Um, so I'm really excited to hear him lay the groundwork um, for us on how the utility industry is working. Okay. Uh, thank you, Aaron, and uh, thank you everyone here for um, allowing us to come uh, and speak at your meeting. Um, you know, typically when you start these presentations, you have the slide saying, oh, you know, here's who I am and where I'm from. Um, I'm going to do that about third or fourth just to shake things up. But <laughs> I assume everyone here has electricity in their home and in their office or uh, and that you all um, appreciate it uh, and miss it when it's gone. 
Well, our member electric power companies are the same way. They appreciate it, and uh, they appreciate the opportunity to deliver it to you because that makes them revenue. Uh, and they also work very hard to make sure when it inevitably does go out, um, because you all are earth science data experts, the earth is often our enemy. Um, most outages in the United States are caused by weather. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion of things like, you know, Russian hacking or cyber attacks and whatnot, but uh, really weather is the primary cause of outages in the U.S., including major outages. Uh, so while we appreciate Mother Earth, sometimes she does um, damage to our infrastructure. Before getting into some of the disaster response uh, initiatives the industry has, um, I would be remiss of not pointing out that there are really several types of electricity providers in the United States. The, there are the largest number in terms of companies are publicly owned utilities. So these are, um, in colloquial terms, municipal utilities or munis. So if you are from, say, Los Angeles or Orlando, Florida, or Jacksonville, Florida, um, your electricity provider is owned by your city or, in some cases, a county government. Um, then there are about 25% uh, of the, in terms of numbers of providers, are cooperative utilities. So this, these are the rural electric cooperatives, many of which are not anymore in rural areas like suburban Atlanta. Um, but that makes up about um, a little over 25% of the industry. And then my segment of this sector are investor-owned power companies. Uh, so these are um, privately owned uh, but publicly traded companies uh, that reflect only about 6% in terms of pure numbers. However, our members have roughly 70% of the ultimate end users. So there are three pieces of the industry, and a lot of times when I'm on these panels, my colleagues from the associations that represent each of those other segments are here. So I'm gonna try to do them a little bit of um, a solid by noting some of their programs. Um, but my point is that the industry is not necessarily monolithic in terms of the companies that, and the entities that participate in it. However, we do tend to operate in similar fashions when it comes to disaster response. And increasingly, we are more aligned as we try to address perhaps very, very significant large um, disasters, uh, things like Superstorm Sandy or beyond. And, and I'll touch on some of those future threats in a little bit. So um, I represent Edison Electric Institute. We're in the middle there. Um, our members, as I said, are the shareholder-owned electric companies. Uh, there's another association, the American Public Power Association, that represents the municipal utilities, and the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association that represents um, cooperatives. And again, you can get some idea on numbers. There's about 2,000 munis. We have 67 um, holding company members at EEI. That makes up about 100 operating companies. Um, and then there are about 900 cooperatives. So, you know, when you think of electric companies, there's obviously a lot of them out there. Here's our slide. Um, this is EEI's membership. We're in all 50 states. Um, as I said, we serve about 70% of ultimate customers. And the munis and co-ops are basically in the, in the, in the, in the negative space there, in the white space. Um, not disparaging them, I'm just, <laughs> that's where they are. Where they are. And, and you'll also note that those, um, with the exception of say big cities, particularly for the cooperatives, um, they are tend to be in more rural areas uh, and that brings some incumbent challenges in um, both serving customers and particularly worth storing customers if your density is much less. Um, it takes a lot more effort to you know, restore, say, 10 customers if there's one per mile rather than 10 per mile, obviously. So when the power goes out, uh, basically all utilities work in roughly the same process. Um, you go from big to small. Uh, first is you want to restore your power plants. Uh, if you can't make electricity, then load 
using entities obviously um, don't have their lights on. Um, then it sort of goes down into uh, the transmission system. These are, if you think of the wires that you see out there, these are the big wires. Um, the distribution system is the smaller wires that ultimately go to your home or business premises. Uh, then substations, a critical component of the electric system. This is what um, either steps up or steps down electricity. Uh, for full disclosure, I'm not an electrical engineer, so if you ha want to talk about how electricity is made, I can give you a very high overview. Um, and then you get down into, um, so really you, you work on restoring the bulk system first, biggest bang for the buck. Then emergency providers, this could be hospitals, fire stations, perhaps emergency shelters. Uh, most utilities have um, a list of these that they designate in advance by working with their local communities. You know, we need to restore this hospital before that hospital, um, this fire station before that fire station. Other infrastructure entities, uh, water, uh, pumping stations, uh, perhaps some fuel stations. Uh, then you move to basically large service areas, or what are called main feeders, so that's generally you know, the lines that go down a major road, and then ultimately the line that goes down to your house at the end of the road, and you wonder why you're not getting your power on day one after a major hurricane. But you know, the goal is to obviously do this first safely, but second efficiently. So there, I was at a meeting yesterday where um, uh, a, a, a restoration expert from actually Kerry's company, Duke Energy, noted that sometimes they will go in and restore, say, a feeder, um, and then they'll have to leave to go and fix another large feeder. And people on that street might say, well, how come like, they didn't fix the hookup all the way to my house? But the main goal is to do that so there's the most bang for the buck. Now, electric companies are large entities, but they're not staffed for 100% um, coverage for disasters, so for 50, 60 years, really probably since the beginning of the industry, this concept of mutual assistance um, or in the uh, public power side, uh, mutual aid is has developed where companies basically voluntary, voluntarily partner with each other to provide support in a disaster. And typically that's human capital. Um, you know, you need people to restore power uh, to put up poles, string lines, and the like. So what mutual assistance does is, is multiplies the workforce for companies. Um, if Pepco, the local utility here, was to say, you know, we had a big ice storm tomorrow, <coughs> which I'm not predicting, but uh, they might call on their neighbors close by and say, Baltimore, to come down. We need 500 extra guys so we can restore people quickly. So those processes have been gone, going on for a long time. And the good thing about it is it's very flexible. Um, amongst our members at EEI, we have tried to design the system so it scales from local to regional to ultimately a national response. And I'll talk about that in a second. Now, all three of the segments of the electricity sector operate their mutual assistance process in sort of a similar way. So, and, I won't go into details here, but it basically, again, it thinks about concentric circles and you know, regions scaling up to national. Among, for our um, segment, we have what we call the national response event, which is where we try to coordinate all the resources at a national level, um, building up from our regional networks that run response during a typical emergency. As we've looked forward to future threats, um, coordinating with the government has really become very, very important. Um, and the industry operates through the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council. Coordinating councils were set up after 9-11 by DHS, and there's one for all of the critical infrastructures. And the point here is that we look to try to build unity of effort and unity of message, particularly with federal partners, so that the industry can work in a combined and unified fashion with the federal government for disaster response. 
a little bit about the threat landscape, and this gets to some of the challenges we have going forward. You know, my favorite on the uh, high likelihood but relatively low consequence, our friend the squirrel. Um, squirrels do actually cause a significantly large number of outages in the United States. Um, and as you go across the bottom axis, obviously you get to the things that people like to talk about, the scary stuff. Uh, nuclear hazards, uh, EMP, biological problems, basically acts of war. Um, those have immense consequences, but are actually very unlikely. So when you get to what are the data needs to help us safely and efficiently restore power, it comes down to, in, in, in my mind, sort of four broad areas, and I think Carrie will probably be able to talk about how it's more directly used in a company, but you have geographic information, obviously. Um, you have weather information, as weather is a huge impact on the utility industry. Um, and that gets down into things like um, you know, mapping, route planning. Uh, restoration often requires movement of people for restoration of physical damage. And then finally, the cross-sector infrastructure awareness is an area that's become increasingly important because we are very interdependent with other sectors. Just as everyone relies on electricity, we rely on water, natural gas, which powers power plants, um, also liquid fuels, our trucks run on diesel, obviously. Um, the transportation sector, be it roads, rail to move heavy equipment. Um, finance, an interesting challenge in that if, say, the power's out for a long time, nobody pays their bill, the electric company doesn't have any money, how do they pay people to fix the system so they can start providing electricity to make money, um, you know, sort of unique challenges. And then ultimately, communication networks. Um, as the system has become more digital, uh, we rely heavily on telecommunications to run the system and to communicate, and those systems are often impacted adversely in a storm or other um, incident. So finally, there's a couple areas where we're really looking, I think, for potential opportunities. Um, I don't know if anybody's talked about UAS as yet. Drones are becoming incredibly useful for companies for damage assessment. Um, and then thinking about GIS or really earth science data uh, into some of the emergency tools and programs we have. We have some tools we've developed that support our industry response. Uh, Ramp up helps us allocate resources. Uh, the whole concept of mutual assistance, um, having good information um, during stressful times is so critical. Uh, how do we move spare equipment? And then finally, and I think this is where your organization can play a very valuable and vital role, is how do we coordinate our private sector uh, with public sector data and even private sector data to try to make that decision making more impactful um, to ultimately bring power back to customers when they need it. And I think that's it. Now, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Wally. I think one of the last things he mentioned was about the long-term outages, and that was something that I had never, it had never crossed my mind that we could be without power for a long time or how that would, would affect us. Um, so with that, the next speaker that we have is Carrie Hicks, and Carrie is coming from the Duke Energy Company, and she's a GIS specialist um, and a data analyst, and she also has experience working with remotely sensed data. So I'm really excited to have her here because I think she's going to give us um, sort of a boots on the ground understanding of how Duke Energy is using, using data. <coughs> And at the end of all of these presentations, we're going to have time for questions. So I hope that you know, as you're thinking of things, please jot them down, and then we'll we'll come back and have a conversation. Okay. Thank you, Erin. So keeping with the sort of theme of facilitating that relationship between data users and data producers. Um, I'm going to be going a little bit into the background of Duke Energy and what our data situation looks like in its current state. And I'm also going to be talking a little bit about sort of where we came from, how that's all changed and evolved in the last 20 years or so. And then some of the challenges that we faced, particularly when it comes to disaster response, and I'll be using Hurricane Matthew as my case study for that. 
So the story of data at Duke, and that's kind of hard to read, but I'll read it to you, no worries. Um, we have actually, over the last 10 years, acquired several rather large utilities. And as anybody you know who's been a part of a merger knows, um, when that happens, you get about 200 different ways of doing things all under one roof. So back in 20, uh, 2006, we acquired Synergy, um, which was actually a merger in and of itself between the Cincinnati Gas and Electric Company and PSI. Um, and that actually is where we extended into the Midwest. And we acquired Progress Energy in 2012, which allowed us to acquire significant um, land in Florida. And then most recently last year, um, we signed a deal to acquire Piedmont Natural Gas in North Carolina. So just kind of you know talking about that situation where you have a lot of people doing things in very different ways, um, you know, using different kinds of technology. We have people using Intergraph or also known as GTEC. Um, we have people using Esri to collect data and to do analysis. We have people using paper maps and that's it. You know, they don't have a GIS system yet. So we've been in the process in the last couple years, um, there's a program called Enable. And the whole point of that was to bring everybody in the company under one um, umbrella and everybody using the same software, ideally. That's kind of, you know, a little more hard, difficult than it sounds, but, and um, that is actually rolling out this year. So as of this year, everybody will be using the same technology, supposedly. Everybody will be doing things the exact same way and it will be perfect and there will be no problems. <laughs> So talking about what our data actually looks like, um, we actually are a little bit of a hybrid, in my mind, between a producer and a user. Um, we actually produce quite a lot of data that doesn't go anywhere but stay internal. Um, we don't share a lot of data. You know, coming from the private sector, especially a utility, we're very, very um, uncomfortable with sharing data, and I think that that's very slowly changing. But as far as external sources of data go, we actually use um, local municipalities and uh, city governments for a lot of our land base. So our land base, things like parcels, street center lines, um, right of way, a lot of that comes from external sources. And then we participate in a lot of data sharing and consortium. So I'm actually on the board of um, IGIC, which is the Indiana GIS Council and also CAGIS, which is the Cincinnati Area GIS. So those are organizations that are meant to bring data sharing together, and we work a lot with them to sort of, we share some of our data, and they provide us with really, really good quality data as well. We also use a lot of external services, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, when I talk about Hurricane Matthew. Um, but we you know, can't thank organizations like NOAA and the National Weather Service enough for providing those awesome REST services because Sometimes, you know, when it comes to a disaster, you don't know what you need until you need it right now. Um, and that was definitely the case with Matthew. So we use a lot of those services, especially during storms. And then we contract a lot of our data. So we may pay a third party company to go out and collect GPS coordinates um, of manholes in Cincinnati, for example. And we actually purchase a lot of exclusive rights to data. I think that's kind of been the norm for a long time in the private sector. I think that's changing as well. And lastly, we do use some remotely sensed data like LIDAR, um, but that's particularly common with transmission and vegetation. Um, and I'm more on the distribution side, so we haven't quite ventured into that on my end of things as much. And we would love nothing more than to use drones, um, but that's not happened yet. So I'm crossing my fingers. Um, internally, our primary GIS data store is Small World. So some of you may have heard of Small World before. Um, that is where 99% of our GIS data comes from. We also use Maximo for customer data, for work management as well. We have a lot of AutoCAD and MicroStation going on, especially for um, what we call internal world. So internal to the substation or inside of a switch gear, um, we really have to use non-spatial diagrams to model that. And we have thousands of databases roaming around out there um, that we really haven't corralled together yet. So we've got you know, Oracle spatial databases and SQL Server databases that um, they're just kind of operating um, on their own. So we're working on getting that together. And paper. So uh, it was only five years ago that um, the Midwest GIS, that's the organization that I'm a part of, was formed. 
And we had boxes and boxes of work orders and maps and just paper information that had not made its way to our GIS system. So the last couple of years has been spent really focusing on getting all of our data actually accounted for. And I'm sure that there's stuff that's still not accounted for. So it's an ongoing process. And it's just a quick little image that shows kind of how our small world Aegis system actually is the hub of all of the GIS data at our company. It feeds everything from Maximo, which is our project management system, uh, Call Before You Dig, which, you know, you want to call before you dig, just throwing that out there. Um, DMS, which is our outage management system. Um, CMS, which is our customer management system. So it's really where all of that data comes from is from small world. So I kind of, I feel like um, in a lot of organizations and companies, their GIS evolves in a similar fashion. And it tends to start with paper records, which for us it certainly did. And that tends to migrate to non-spatial technology like AutoCAD or MicroStation, which then slowly sort of evolves into spatial data. So you, for us it was small world, for many others it's Esri or a similar sort of uh, structure. And then eventually, after some time, you get into an integrated or an enterprise GIS structure. And, you know, it's not exactly linear, obviously. Um, I kind of simplified it. And for us in particular, you know, we're still kind of going through all of these in sort of each step every day. Um, but you can kind of model it that way. But what I find really interesting is after you get to that point, once you have that integrated enterprise GIS, all the data is in the same place, everybody can access it, it's awesome. Then what, you know, how do you take it to the next level? How do you make it even better? Like, how do you make your geography work for you? And, you know, I would think that we're probably in this area right here, especially after Enable has been deployed. Um, but I'd like to, like to get further into that question mark very soon. So once you get to that question mark point, then you start sending your people to conferences and they start getting a lot of cool ideas. And you hear buzzwords like, you know, the internet of things, you know, putting sensors in people's PPE when they go out so we can track them everywhere they go. Or, you know, real-time data. You know, we may have heard of the Esri's, you know, geo event extension, you know, being able to have real-time data or updated, you know, every couple of minutes, you know, has become really important. Or big data, you know, that's another buzzword. Once you get enough data, there's some really interesting analysis you can do with it. And cloud storage. Um, it's important for me to mention cloud storage because, you know, we've all heard of Amazon server and, and how amazing cloud technology has become. But for a lot of companies, that's just not an option currently. And Duke Energy is certainly one of those companies. We are very, very hesitant to store data in the cloud for security reasons. But I think that's slowly starting to change and we're starting to become a little more open minded. Um, but, you know, it, it's definitely a slow process to get to that point. But what's really missing from all of those is this idea of collaboration. Um, so I'm actually working with um, GeoCollaborate as well on sort of a test project to see if we can't bring all of that data together in a way that allows people to sit down and work together in a virtual environment to make geospatially informed decisions. And I think once you have an enterprise GIS, it's integrated, it's all in one place, the natural next step would be to create sort of a um, a virtual meeting space where that data all comes together, people can make decisions in real time based on uh, relevant information. So to kind of bring all of that together, I'm going to talk about our experience with Hurricane Matthew. So um, I'm sure everybody knows about Hurricane Matthew, but in case anybody was living under a rock at that point, um, Hurricane Matthew was a hurricane that hit Florida and the Carolinas last October. And Duke Energy had about a million people without power uh, immediately following the hurricane. And, you know, they originally forecast that Florida would get the brunt of the hit, but it ended up being actually um, Georgia and the Carolinas that got the worst of it. And we had massive flooding damage, um, especially on the western side of North Carolina from storm surge and rain. And it was so bad that we had entire substations submerged, which are not good for them. Um, you don't want substations underwater, that's never a good thing. So when we have a situation like a disaster or a storm, um, oftentimes employees like myself will be put under storm duty, which basically means your life belongs to the storm until otherwise noted. And um, we all go into what's called a war room. 
So this is uh, not what our war room looks like, but I liked it. Kind of represents the feel, you know, kind of what it feels like. And traditionally, um, when these situations arose, whether it's a small outage or a large one, everybody would crowd together in a room. People would print off maps and put them on the wall and put them on the table and mark them up. And you know, we'd deploy people out to start restoring power. The problem with that is with paper maps, as you can imagine, you are not getting the most recent data that you can possibly get. You don't know exactly what the weather's doing. You don't know what the floodwaters might be doing. And you don't know exactly who is out. You know, for a long time, if a customer didn't call in to say, I don't have power, we didn't know about it. You know, it wasn't automatic. And in areas, it still isn't automatic. So when Hurricane Matthew hit, we all crowded in a conference room in Cincinnati, you know, supporting from a, from a remote location. And I mentioned earlier a program that we have called My World. So it's developed by Ubisense. It's a web application. It brings together all of our Aegis data into one place to be viewed. And we initially said, well, why don't you guys use My World? You know, you've got this great application. This was, you know, we paid a company to create this for you. But it ended up turning out that it wasn't exactly what they needed. Um, the biggest problems with it really stemmed around the fact that it wasn't interactive in the way that they needed it. It wasn't real time, you know, it didn't have routing information. You know, we had routing mentioned earlier, that's very important. Um, with Matthew, we had road closures all over North Carolina. So a 30 minute drive might turn into a four hour drive. Um, and in some cases they did. Uh, and it just didn't have exactly what they needed. So in response, um, our group created a web app and it was simple. It was just using um, ArcGIS's web app builder and it incorporated routing. Uh, which used real-time traffic data from uh, Esri's traffic service. We incorporated uh, live weather information as well as flood modeling um, from NOAA, which was an absolute lifesaver. It allowed us to predict where the floodwaters were gonna rise and where they were gonna sink, which was really important for planning, you know, where we were gonna deploy people. And it ended up being a huge success. And it turned out that a lot of people in our company weren't really aware of our GIS. They didn't know what it was capable of. But when that application got sent out there, people started using it. They, you know, were, oh, wow, oh, okay, that's, that's really neat. So it ended up almost being kind of unintentional advertising for our GIS system. And once that happened, you know, people came back and said, hey, can we do that with this other thing? Or, you know, can we start preparing other applications like that for outages or for deployment of crews and it really sort of put that out there so this was the actual war room <laughs> this was in Raleigh and you can see there's actual paper maps uh, printed out surrounding that map there um, we included a, a custom printing option with our app people could print um, whatever size they needed and it ended up being very very successful that's the web app I can't show it to you unfortunately but I can show you a screenshot so lessons learned from Matthew, um, we are almost at integration. I should have put an asterisk there, but not collaboration yet. So that's something that I think is going to be the next step to bring our GIS to the next level. We have a real need for real-time data, um, and that's really critical for storm situations or other disasters. And most importantly, I think flexibility and agility. You know, we need um, data now. You know, if there's a situation where we, we need something, we may not anticipate that until that situation has arisen. So, you know, having that ability, you know, all of you work with data, um, you come from organizations that produce data. Um, so having that agility and flexibility is very important. And lastly, real-time analytics. So being able to do that, that flood water analysis to say the flood waters are gonna rise here um, was very, very important. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carrie. I mean, I think that you've really, um, you set the panel up nicely. I'm actually going to go back to one of your slides because um, I think where we are now is um, we've heard from Frank about um, user feedback at NASA, and then we've heard from two users. And I think where the next two panelists go is really into this question mark of what do we do when we have, when we have our own systems. And so I'm really delighted to introduce Rich Frazier who's the technical, a technical advisor for the FGDC, the Federal Geographic Data Committee Secretariat. Um, and he leads, sorry, trying to lead, read from my phone. Um, 
leads and supports the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. And we ran across Rich's work when we were at GEO in November. Um, and so I'm really happy that he's here to talk about the Amira Geos data platform that he's been working on. So thank you, Aaron, for the introduction. Appreciate it. One of my duties and responsibilities is to support the USGO efforts on um, developing the Amerigios community platform. So I'm pleased to be with you today, and I'm very passionate about this, so I'm going to try really hard to stay within the 10-minute um, threshold that has been assigned. So a little bit about the Amerigios effort just to start out. It's a capacity building effort to enable the user community. It is composed of the Americas Caucus within GEO. There are 16 countries that are currently part of that caucus. We have several observers from other countries that we hope that will join the effort long term as well. So the Amerigios community platform, um, it's a regional community effort. It's a resource to promote collaboration and coordination amongst the GEO members in the Americas. We hope that the community platform, which is a user-driven effort, it's one of the key principles that we have established as part of the community's goals and objectives, is to be a resource to share, find, discover, learn, and participate in coordination of Earth observations and usability of Earth observations, working with various providers or within the community. So what you see here, this graphic up top, really speaks to a lot of the user requirements and the feedback that we've received so far. And I'll talk to that more so in terms of the platform itself and what some of the expectations are. So as you look at this, one of the first things that the community established from more of a business context is what are those thematic communities that Amerigias will focus on as priorities? And they are within the agriculture, disasters, water, and biodiversity domains. In terms of requirements, the users identified five key areas. They needed data, they needed tools to exploit the data, they needed products that can help um, interpret the data and services and resources that would allow them to use those to use these data efficiently. As part of the data domain and resource requirements, they want to be able to find, get, and use social, economic, and environmental data um, along with the Earth observation data to provide understanding and decision making for the various stakeholders. The data within a data domain, we endeavor to set up a catalog for data access, data resources, that the community will be able to share, publish, and manage the data and use data from the various providers, that we will be able to search the data across many different dimensions and within many different contexts and groupings. And most importantly within the community, the goal of co-creation, curation, harmonizing, and being able to enrich and tag that data so that it can be used efficiently amongst the stakeholders. Over on the right here, you see a little bit of what I'll talk a little bit more about the data hub that has come out of this initiative. And I'll also just kind of really kind of set the stage that this is a prototype and pilot initiative that we hope that will go into operation in 2017. So this initiative kicked off in 2016. We've been working through these activities based upon the user requirements over the past six months. The next key area is tools, and one of the key areas in terms of the stakeholders is being able to take the data, use the data to synthesize the information, and have the analytical tools and so forth that will support their ability to create the products that are necessary to support understanding and decision making. One of the key findings through a research effort that we have done with them is that there is a lot of data out there, but there aren't a lot of tools to bring that data together, to assimilate that data, to determine authoritative data sources and resources and so forth as part of their ability to create the products that are necessary to support decision makers. That they need to be able to have the ability to visualize that data and model the data and resources efficiently and effectively. So we've identified, working with that community, a number of different needs and resources that are necessary to support their abilities and capabilities to support the various 
co-created products, because it's not just looking at the U.S. specifically, but it will be looking across the entire region as well. You see some of those tools here, just kind of flashing here on the right-hand side, and, and one of the key principles that we identified as well is not to reinvent the wheel, to take advantage of the resources that are out there from the providers wherever possible, and then work towards integrating those resources and aggregating those resources where possible to support the community. In terms of products, the idea that as these products are being created within the community or being shared within the community, that these resources will be made available to the entire community across the Americas, and that as the communities work together which is within each of these thematic areas, that these products and services will be made available within the community um, in a dynamic context that they can help work towards developing these, whether it's a disaster, whether it's just for general use or purposes or other needs. You see some of these again on the right hand side when you see it flashing, that's basically um, what we're trying to uh, show here. Some of the services that have been identified within the community that is needed, um, I hope you all are familiar with some of these terms, but like geo netcast, having access to satellite data and information, uh, having access to training resources, workshops, alerts and notifications, and so forth. So this is just a summary highlight of some of those user needs that have been identified and how we hope that the community platform will be able to support those user needs. And again, we're working very closely with those various user communities within each of the thematic focus areas. There are thematic leads that have been assigned for each of those thematic areas. Lastly, just in the context of resources, um, the community is hoping for some of the basic things that are necessary in the way of news, social media resources, community calendars, collaboration tools as a firm foundation to be able to collaborate and do the co-creation and so forth. Um, in terms of a user-driven resource, this kind of gives you a context of what we've been doing from a capacity building standpoint in terms of the user-driven framework. We engage the users as one of the first foundations, first through building um, partnerships with the various communities that are already established. Where we can take advantage of those communities that have been established, we try to use those first rather than reinventing the wheel and restarting the process. You see some of the partnerships we've started with uh, some of the initiatives in GEO, like GEOBOND, GEOGLAM, GEOGLOWS, Disasters Initiative within GEO, and others. In engaging the users, we've been doing needs assessments, and we've conducted quite a few of those with the community in terms of what their needs are. And what you see here in the center more is what are those outputs. That's how we determine the data, tools, products, services, et cetera. Within each of those domains, there are key areas or principles or ideas of what their expectations were. So this kind of gives you more of a snapshot of everything you saw in the previous frames. So in 2016, we established a platform beta as a foundation. We focused on and we developed the prototype data hub. We developed some of the visualization tools and services that they were seeking. And we established the community capabilities as a foundation as part of the pilot and prototype. In 2017, we'll be focusing more on outreach and education, data sharing, thematic data and tools, and some use cases. That's one of the key things we want to do in 2017, is some use cases to identify the key data sets that are needed, and then turning those, some of that data into products and services for decision making, and we hope to be able to present those as part of the GEO plenary this year, which will be hosted in the US, by the way. This is our architecture. Don't want to scare you because I know that can be overwhelming when people say architecture is very technical. But just to know, these are some of how we translated the user requirements from some of the key stakeholders. We've identified five key stakeholder groups from the user-driven analysis that we've been doing with that community. We've identified some of the features, functions, and services that are needed, some of the analytics and so forth that are expected. And we're using an open source CCAN, I hope you all are familiar with CCAN, as an open source resource to be able to bring those resources together from the various providers and share those within the community. We're linking national capabilities, regional capabilities, and global capabilities in terms of being able to provide these resources. We're tapping national resources where available. Many of the national entities already use CCAN, which is great. And I would encourage you all, um, if you are a US constituent, to register your data and information with data.gov. But we're working with all of the other countries to do very similarly, and then we're bringing those together within the AmeriGIS community platform. We, are, we have developed and implemented several data and visualization tools. 
One of the things that we've been doing as part of the Marriott GEOS initiative, because we have a number of areas where they have limitations in technology and so forth, is we bring the data to them. We bring the resources to them, the visualization, the analytics and so forth within the community platform so they don't have to go out and find those things. And that way, if they need to just pull the data in a mobile context, they can pull it for an offline resource as well. We've implemented over 40 different data explorers, viewers, and analytical resources that will be engaged. And our inventory continues to increase as providers identify resources that they have that can support it. So that pretty much wraps up, you know, in terms of a context of all the different things that we're trying to do in terms of the platform itself, and it continues to evolve. And we hope that um, we actually have a website where it's online. I will share that with Erin so that she can send it out to everyone if you're interested in taking a look at it. You will not be able to see the data hub because that's something that the community asked us to keep right now as a closed loop until there's a formal approval. Thanks, Rich. It's really great work and I think exciting to see how it progresses this year. Um, so our last speaker is Christoph Obrecht um, from the World Bank and he's seconded from ESA. And I actually just met Christoph in the last week, maybe. Thanks to Sudir, you know, this is a nice community for making connections. and. So I think where Christoph comes from is that the World Bank has been piloting using ESA data in their um, their programs and they've realized that it's really useful and really successful and so now they have, um, they're going towards operational models for that and so Christoph is going to talk about that. Thanks, Erin, for the introduction, for the last minute invitation. So, um, well, uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm really a very hybrid, um, well, hybrid between the user and the provider here, um, from the provider side at ESA and the user at the uh, World Bank. Um, well, as we are running late a little bit, I should maybe just use every second slide, and then at the end we can see if it makes sense, or no, ma making fun. Um, Okay, so I'm seconded from the Directorate of Earth Observation Programs of the European Space Agency to the World Bank, and I'm uh, coordinating all the collaborative activities that are uh, going on between the two institutions. And mostly this is about an initiative we call Earth Observation for Sustainable Development. And I'll uh, go a little bit in more details on that. Um, I wanted to show this and it actually included sound. I wanted to wake everybody up, including myself, as I'm still jet lagged, but there's no sound. So anyway, it's uh, still a nice uh, illustration. Of why am I showing it? Not only to wake uh, everybody up, but it's sometimes very difficult to communicate in, in uh, you know, user communities and especially in the environment like the World Bank. Um, you know, how to use Earth observation. For them, it's rocket science and they just want to, you know, don't touch, it's, it's too complicated. Um, well, it's really not like this anymore nowadays, right? And we try to promote uh, the use of Earth observation data of uh, analytics, spatial analytics in general, in World Bank operations, and slowly, slowly we are getting to, you know, getting there. Um, very brief uh, about, you know, this is the Earth observation program of ESA. Um, you know, most recently the Copernicus program in uh, collaboration with the European Commission includes the Sentinel family, which is probably at the moment the most advanced Earth observation program. And um, well, there are probably more NASA people in here than ESA people. So I still keep that uh, statement. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's obviously a lot of collaboration going on. Um, this illustration shows the, the paradigm shift that we are basically in at the moment and other also commercial providers like Planet and, and others um, very much touch, you know, this aspect of the space and time, um, you know, uh, that both spatial resolution and temporal uh, resolution are important and the Sentinels uh, in that sense address it by having a twin constellation in the same orbit, just 180 degrees phased. So we have, we cut the revisit time in half and still keep the uh, pretty high resolution. So this is very important for a lot of aspects in the World Bank, be it agriculture, be it flood, 
uh, whatever disasters um, to still you know have both the both sides of the of the coin. Um, ESA and the bank have uh, worked together for quite a couple of years already. Started in 2008. Um, there, you know, we had a lot of small-scale demonstration projects uh, about the use of Earth observation data and services in World Bank operations. We also work with other international financial institutions. But at some point, we really came to the conclusion it's enough. Uh, the value has been demonstrated. We now need to scale it up. Uh, and so in Paris at the um, uh, climate conference, ESA and the World Bank signed a new MOU at highest uh, uh, senior management level. And we now work uh, strategically together on um, not small scale uh, projects anymore, but large scale engagement. And we did the same with the Asian Development Bank uh, just uh, last year. A um, few examples of those um, projects, you know, land use, land cover information, dynamics. We helped the World Bank uh, build their uh, data platform called Puma, where they put all the urban, uh, urban data, urban spatial data on and archive it and ex uh, facilitate access to it. Um, we also, um, together with, the, with some World Bank funding, uh, the German uh, space agency developed that uh, global high resolution built up area product, uh, global urban footprint it's called. Um, detect detection and characterization of informal settlements, also important in a disaster context as you need to classify different types of exposure in urban settings. Um, landslide inventory mapping, um, you know, flood mapping, climate risk mitigation. So we really address the entire portfolio of uh, sustainable development in our engagement in the uh, uh, yeah, sustainable development community. The longer term vision, so what we are working on right now is uh, well initiative called Earth Observation for Sustainable Development. And we really try to mainstream and transfer Earth Observation into the operational working processes and the workflow uh, of the World Bank and international development in general. And while well, the idea is to really show that Earth Observation can be a best practice source of environmental information for a lot of, of work that is done in that uh, domain. We have uh, 10 thematic priority areas identified, three of which we are, we are already active, urban agriculture and water are active. Uh, disaster risk management, climate resilience and fragile states are the next ones that we will uh, uh, start this year. And all of this is also integrated in the overall you know, framework of UN and global sustainable development. Um, and uh, basically, let me go a little bit further, how the, this implementation looks like. We have two phases. Uh, um, so every thematic cluster is three years where ESA provides the funding uh, for an expert uh, consortium of partners, mostly from the European Earth Observation Service industry, to engage with the uh, banks. Uh, and uh, phase one is really about strategic planning and stakeholder engagement. So we, we don't wanna only want to provide them data. So all the ESA data is free anyway, but uh, we really want to go further down the value chain and engage with the clients and the users. Uh, and what is a user in a World Bank context? It's a country, right? So the client, a client of World Bank is a country. So your first entry point is Ministry of Finance, and then you somehow tickle down the, the line. But so we try to also train those countries, the respective authorities in the countries, uh, in using the tools that are developed uh, so that once the World Bank you know, gets out uh, and once the projects are, are done, these countries can still keep using uh, the tools and, and, and the data. Um, this is just an example of the urban uh, project, urban development cluster um, that we are currently, um, that is ongoing. So we, we have projects all over the, the globe, basically, where we engage. And these have been selected strategically with the respective leadership teams in the international financial institutions. And I'm you know, doing the, the World Bank and also part of the Inter-American Development Bank work on this. Um, as I said, it's, it's really not about data, um, but still data is the first, uh, the first aspect, obviously. So we need to promote data literacy. Um, we need to get away from World Bank people believing that this is just rocket science. So first of all, we need to um, facilitate easy and most efficient data access, right? Yeah, ESA, as an example, I just put the Sentinel Scientific Data Hub where uh, anybody can go and, and access and download the data. Um, 
We also, as we just saw with GEO, we are quite strongly engaged with GEO. For example, we host and uh, co-developed the, the GEO portal that's just um, starting to to run now. There's not too much data on yet, but I, I found one example where you can uh, visualize Sentinel data. Um, and after accessing the data, it's really about exploiting the data. And especially in the user context, this is uh, you know, the most important thing. So it's not about the data, it's about the analytical services and about understanding and, and uh, deriving uh, additional knowledge. And we have a, a concept at ESA that we call thematic exploitation platforms. Um, feel free to Google um, TEPS. So you will find we have TEPS on several domains. And as this is a disaster panel, so I, I, I took the geohazards tab. And what is this tab uh, about? It's really uh, about facilitating access to data, but also getting a user community of a, sp a specific domain together. So there is a forum there um, and plus uh, analytical cap uh, capabilities. So you can uh, produce uh, your, you can put your tools up there. You can develop your tools. You can process on the cloud. Uh, you can download uh, end products. Uh, we also try to address different levels of users. So from the expert user to the very, very um, basic user who still wants to push a button, but actually doesn't know which parameters to, to adjust. So we try to address the user community in different uh, levels in that regard. Um, yeah, this is just a, a screenshot of how these toolboxes look like uh, at, the, at the basic level. And you can, if you are registered as, as the highest level user, you can actually adjust the, the actual code of the, of the tool as well. Um, well, I, I leave it to that. Um, I just want to say really it's about, especially in the disaster community, um, because now this is a very different user community than the utility companies. and. I tried to make some connection and, and I found it when actually during my time at NOAA, we were using uh, nighttime lights data that you see here uh, for power outage detection. And we worked closely with the Florida um, electricity company at that time, I remember. Um, and so earth observation data really can help in almost every aspect and every phase of disaster risk management cycle. And at that time it enabled us to actually identify the you know, power outage areas in the night after the disaster. Um, so, you know, earth observation can be very useful in many aspects. And once you identify and detect it, then you can measure it quantitatively uh, and communicate it to the user and try to address the, the challenge afterwards. So I guess uh, that's what this is all about. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. And Jeff is at the mic, um, so this is the time. I would really like to open it up to all of you, um, both for questions and comments and feedback to the panelists. So Jeff, take it away. Great, thank you all for a very good panel. Uh, my name is Jeff de la Beaujardiere. I'm with NOAA, and my question is especially to Wally and Carrie. You mentioned weather as sort of the biggest cause of outages. Well, the even bigger potential cause of outages is space weather or geomagnetic disturbances as they were called on your slide, Wally. Um, and as you probably know, if we were to have a major solar storm event, uh, we could knock out you know, the entire grid on a continental scale essentially, um, destroying the large transformers which take a long time to build that we don't have a big supply of and that are often supplied by other nations now as I understand. So we could be out of power for months, years, maybe. Um, so that's terrible. But the good news is, if you know the solar storm is coming, perhaps because you listen to the NOAA uh, Space Weather Prediction Center, you can just do an orderly shutdown of the grid and let it all wash over you. And we're in the dark for a while, but then we just turn everything back on. That's great. So my question is, uh, I guess, two part. What are the utilities yours and more generally doing to really be sure we are totally ready to shut things down in an orderly way and that it actually works? And then do you need anything from NOAA in the Space Weather Prediction Center in terms of you know, better data, better anything to help make that happen? Um, great question. Um, one, the, um, the utility industry does actually have NERC standards for um, GMD disruptions. Um, so the industry is... Uh, fairly well positioned um, and is obviously cognizant of the challenge. Uh, the, you know, 
people often conflate GMD and EMP, um, and that's a big mistake because GMD impacts are obviously better understood. There's a little bit of, you know, predictability. You have to do everything at the speed of light, so you get, what, about eight minutes um, maybe. Um, it, actually, you'd probably have more. There's also um, been a lot of attention to this from um, the federal government. Uh, there is um, our, our standards and um, I guess an executive order um, to look at this uh, as well as at EMP. So I think the industry is certainly, you know, it's hard to be perfectly positioned against these types of um, challenges. Um, just to reassure everyone, a couple things. Actually, we are pretty well positioned in terms of spare equipment. Um, I didn't get into that, but that's been a huge focus of mine personally over the past couple years. But to your point, any information that can be given in advance, and I think this will become actually even more critical um, because the transportation bill that passed Congress last year, the FAST Act, um, it gives authority to the Secretary of Energy to order emergency actions um, for, um, for grid um, security disasters. And one of the disasters that is specifically noted is GMD. Um, so I expect there will be greater, if I know the DOE is already working with partners like NASA and NOAA, um, my expectation is that will continue to be advanced in any early warning, obviously the better it is because, you know, unlike an EMP, which is presumably from a, an intentional act from probably a nation state, you know, with, with GMD, you do have some advanced warning. Um, you know, the waves are different. The impact is obviously a good bit different, but the ability to understand that it's coming and any predictive advances um, are certainly critical to being able to, you know, it's not quite as easy as, you know, just turning the dial to off, but um, anything you can go to try to basically disconnect the system. Um, and there's also being a lot of advances on protection devices, which is probably where the biggest focus is, is, you know, can you put something in to basically interrupt it? Um, so, you know, but the predictive data would be probably the key as, as you know, best you can, obviously. Cool. Great. Carrie, Thank anything to add to that from? Sure. Program? I'll just add that. I, and just speaking from Duke Energy's perspective, um, our efforts to really modernize the grid, I think, will um, be really important for strange calamities like that. Just because right now, you know, so much of our equipment is on the older side. Um, so we're investing, you know, billions of dollars all over the Midwest. Um, the Carolinas are pretty much up to par. Um, but once, you know, we're at a point where our grid is up to a modern standard, it will be much easier to respond in a situation like that. And then secondly, we actually have a group of meteorologists that work for Duke. We have our own meteorology department. So they have their eyes on the sky 24-7 um, in case of situations like this or large storms. So uh, we're always kind of keeping an eye out. So Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thanks. And I'm going to ask the panelists to keep it kind of brief too. Everybody keep it kind of brief just so we can get through a few more questions. Great. Brian. Uh, Brian we from uh, Neptune and company. So this question has actually, um, it, it bears a little bit of similar resemblance of Jeff's question. And the question goes to um, offline preparedness, offline preparedness as in, so, so speaking of the World Bank, right? the World Bank uh, GFDRR, the Global Facility on Disaster Reduction and Recovery, is actually prepared um, to have data sets available for deployment, like on, like on la laptops to countries like Haiti, where if anything goes wrong, you cannot depend on connectivity, because uh, we had, you had mentioned real-time data being important. So notwithstanding the fact that real-time data is important for you to, to, to find out what's happening on the ground, the question goes to preparedness and offline capability. So what, what, what in terms of preparedness for offline data capability is being done uh, uh, to, to cater for the fact that, you know, you might have severe outages that last for months, 
or or you, you might have uh, you you would sometimes have data which you think you might need to uh, you might need to run predictive services over the web, but that assumes connectivity. So the question is, at headquarters, is connectivity and uh, a, 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 a big consideration uh, when a disaster hits? And the same question can be asked of your crews that you might deploy from another state to another state. Do they need connectivity uh, on the ground to respond? And if, if, if connectivity is an issue, how do you prepare small critical data sets ahead of these uh, events so that you can operate even if the power grid is out for months or weeks? Sure. So I definitely know from an IT perspective that, um, well, for starters, I'll say that our crews have offline and online capabilities on their tablets. So all of the data that we have available to them through their application is available offline. The only challenge with that is that you run into um, situations where syncing might become an issue, especially if they're doing any editing. Um, but they do have that copy of the data always available. And then from a wider scale, uh, broader scale perspective, we do you know, keep um, copies of data all the time. Um, we have you know, central servers that continuously run that, that sort of make archives um, of our data. So in the case of a broad outage that lasted for a long time, we wouldn't be uh, without any data. So I, I don't know if that answers the question. But. And I wonder if, um, Christoph, do you have anything to add from yeah. World Bank experience? Yeah, actually I do. Um, so before I took on my position at ESA, I was actually leading a spatial analytics team uh, at the World Bank, working mostly on uh, country disaster risk profiles uh, development. And uh, the work in Haiti you mentioned that of GFDRI is, uh, goes a little bit into, into that direction. So having data of a pre-event uh, phase is obviously very important, but um, it certainly doesn't, you know, replace the, the actual real-time data because what the pre-event data tells you is, I mean, you can you can use it to estimate or to assess a potential damage um, given the pre-event status because you know the affected areas and you know the exposure there, you know the asset values. You could you can come up with a first, you know, ballpark figure of where you want to put your resources. So for this one, it's, it's, it's really important because you can start right off, right? So it's, it's extremely valuable to have the pre-event data. But at the same time, to then address the actual situation of disaster, you certainly need to have the constant data flow coming. And um, I mean, remote sensing data is, is good in a way that it provides you a constant data flow, but it's also tricky in a way that, especially if you mention Haiti and, and other tropical countries, um, with the hurricanes and so it's always cloudy so you can't use the optical data you need to use the radar data um, you may deploy some drones whatever but you need to really adjust to circumstances and use the real-time data as well in combination with the pre-event data it's just that's what I wanted to add to that great thank you Steve hi Steve Young retired EPA um, thanks Wally and Carrie for coming from industry and speaking to us um, Jeff kind of anticipated my question, but I, I'd like to refocus it a, a little bit and, and just kind of ask how prepared industry is to ingest real-time warning type data like the um, space weather data. And, and the other example I wanted to throw out, I, I mean, I assume for uh, storms, it's very sophisticated, an incoming hurricane or a derecho or some weather event like that. The other example uh, would be earthquakes. And that little window between the initiation of a major earthquake and when the um, waves hit a particular location. So my limited understanding is that there may be some things you can do during what might be you know, anywhere from a few seconds to several minutes that will help to uh, minimize damage to the, to the system. So I guess, how ready are you to respond to quick turnaround um, warning data? And is there anything we could do to help you in that arena? Well, on the second question, um, yes. I'm, you know, and I'll defer to Carrie to talk specifically about her company. Um, but I mean, I think there's no doubt that better collaboration with data 
providers and collectors and industry for these sorts of, you know, truly, you know, catastrophic type um, incidences would be helpful. Um, I mean, I think that companies in geographies, you know, so companies obviously on the West Coast focus a lot more on, say, earthquakes than um, hurricanes, which is um, more prevalent on the East Coast. The, you know, the challenge, I think, is, you know, what are some ways to connect the right people um, and right organizations so that the information can then be actionable? Um, and that, you know, some of the activities that Tom Moran's doing through the All Hazards Co uh, Consortium is focused on that very challenge of, you know, there's a lot of data out there and how do you get it in a way that, you know, an industry can act operate quickly. Um, you know, I mean, I think specifically the, the industry is certainly getting a, a better and stronger at that. Are, are we in a perfect place for these, you know, um, high impact, low frequency events? You know, honestly, probably not. I mean, I think, I think our industry is in many ways better situated than many other infrastructure industries um, because of things like some of the NERC standards uh, these are the reliability standards that the industry has to follow, um, and those include penalties if you don't follow them. So they have, um, you know, it's it, there's a stick behind them if if you don't. Uh, but I think there's, you know, on that slide of sort of the the challenges or the d threats that you face, you know, the, it's an issue of calibrating for the things that are on the far end. Um, that you know, if they happen, it will be really bad. But, you know, how do you put the resources also to the things that are far more common? Um, and I'm not advocating eradicating squirrels, but um, <laughs> the, the issue of, you know, that balance is a real challenge um, that good information can help make a little easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll revert back to my previous comment about modernization because I think that investment is critical. Right now, if you want to open or close a switch, most of the time you have to physically go out in the field and you have to open that switch. So if there is a, you know, a high impact, low frequency event that we only have eight minutes to prepare for, I can't tell you that we would be able to, you know, shut anything down or, or, or do something like that in a lot of areas because it's just not up to that standard yet. But that, again, is why so much money is being invested to do that. Um, pretty soon, you know, in the next 10 or 15 years, you'll be able to do all of that from the operating center um, or the, the distribution control center. So I think that that and also um, installing uh, communication nodes on a lot of our equipment is really important so that we have live information on what is actually uh, being fed through a piece of equipment. Um, but that's kind of a work in progress. But, you know, like it was mentioned, um, we're really more focused on the high frequency sort of problematic things that happen all the time, like hurricanes and storms and squirrels, um, because those are really the things that can impact our customers on a daily basis. But we have our eye on those uh, rare occurrences too. Great, we're running just a little bit late, um, but Anna, I'm gonna get to your question and we can just be brief here um, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and we'll get to lunch. Okay, um, I'm speaking in a, okay, so, uh, this is a response to your statement of the earth is our enemy. Yeah. And <laughs> I was that was just an overstatement. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> it got me thinking. Yes. And I'm wondering, especially in the energy sectors, how you're using the observations that the earth sciences are providing to see if you can build different ways of providing energy in emergencies. Sure, go ahead. That's a really great question and something that I think about a lot. Um, so Duke Energy is starting to invest a lot of money in solar. That's something that's happened in the last two years. But something that we're really having a challenge with is um, when it comes to reliability, uh, it's a hard thing to move on from things like natural gas and coal because we have such a distribution of power available for that. So if there's an outage and we need backup generators or we need backup power, it's hard to get past that stage of using um, fossil fuels. Um, but it's definitely something that has become really important at our company 
here recently, especially in the wake of, you know, the coal ash um, disaster that happened in North Carolina. Our companies become much more environmentally focused. Um, so that, that would be my answer. And the earth is definitely not the enemy. It's our friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In retrospect, thinking, okay, here's the industry guy saying the enemy. <laughs> let, me re let me retract that. Um, but just to echo on what Carrie said is that, you know, there is no doubt that this industry in the 20 years I've been involved with it has evolved dramatically in terms of the generation sources and the what pollution they put out. Um, and notwithstanding some of the political changes, um, I think the, the economics and the reality of where the energy industry, um, at least on the electric side, is going is moving away, to, away from, you know, traditional fossil fuels, uh, which were coal, to, you know, natural gas has grown dramatically. Mm -hmm. There are some, you know, obviously environmental impacts from natural gas, but it emits fewer pollutants than coal. Um, and... Electric utilities are actually the largest investor in solar and wind in the United States. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for growth there, and utilities are certainly taking advantage of that because as the technology has become less expensive, it's become more viable. Um, and that gets to just one final point is, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about disaster response, but all of the information that you collect and build is just as important for preparation and planning for systems um, that, and, and that could be a whole separate panel and all, uh, but that's just as critical to try to do some of this thinking on the front end rather than after something has happened. Great, great questions. Um, I think let's thank our panelists one more time. And really what's occurred to me, I mean, I think that over the last several years, we've seen a lot of groundwork laid with ESIP's partnership with GEO, with the private sector, um, through the All Hazards Consortium, you know, NASA's ongoing support and, and all of these things coming together. And there was one more thing that I wanted to share, and I asked Luis if he would just say one word. Now we're running late. Um, but um, on the ESIP OGC collaboration, because this is an opportunity to fund work that would... Um, I think, benefit this panel. Thank you, Erin. So, uh, hi, my name is Luis Bermudez. I work at the Open Geospatial Consortium OGC. And uh, we have a collaboration. We are a Type 5 ECIP member. We share similar, um, similar vision principles of openness, collaboration, help share, um, help improve how we share data. And, for example, we have better solutions for disasters. Uh, we have pre previously collaborated in the GEOS pilot and the uh, ESIP, uh, an ESIP observed test bed. They went to our meeting to see how our process work. The way that we do innovation, which is part of one of the main themes that we have between ESIP and OGC, is by doing test beds, prototypes, you know, agile solutions. And we're going to present what we did in test bed 12, which just finished in these two sessions, one today at 4 p.m. and tomorrow at 4 p.m., and then testbed 13, which is going to be based on mass migration models and social systems, and how we can better have open interfaces, open data, open solutions to better support uh, utility companies, uh, government, and, and others. So I invite you to go to these two um, sessions or one of them so you can learn about how to get funded and participate in our process and uh, increase the collaboration that we have. Thank you, Erin. Thank you all. Great. So thank you for your patience as we ran just a little bit late, but um, and thank you for your attention through this session. Lunch is just right next door. Um, and during lunch, at the end of lunch, we'll be recognizing some of our peers. So with that, Thanks so much. There you go. Nice job, everyone.